So we were just listening to a podcast uh, interviewing Don Langman, who's an anthroposophist and um, Waldorf teacher and uh, professor at Emerson College and dramatist and speech uh, actor. Um, and she was discussing her spiritual practice as an anthroposophist and its relationship to her own psychological health and um, how she went to this AA meeting with a friend, not because she was an alcoholic, but she just had this impulse and hearing people honestly talk about their own inner insanity, as she put it, was tremendously relieving to her because she realized she had been hiding from herself that she was struggling internally, certainly hiding from her colleagues. Um, you know, she was excelling in her professional life, even while internally she felt like there was a disconnect. And it started this conversation between us about spiritual practice and transpersonal experience and the struggle to integrate that. Yeah. And it seemed very moving for you on mm -hmm. some level because, I mean, it spoke to you. And yeah, well, it was just this really beautiful collective... Um, how should I put it? Uh, it makes shared what so many people struggle with individually, mm -hmm. it, you know, in an isolated way. And it, you know, she was describing it um, in accordance with what Steiner said about um, the, like, the late 20th century. He said that we would just collectively be crossing the threshold of the spiritual world. So basically, as Don was um, interpreting it, uh, uh, well, that we start to regain some of our spiritual perception. And at the same time, there's this, uh, this opposite constellated by that, um, whereby we have to come to consciousness and like purify basically all of the uh all of everything that's accumulated all the trauma that's accumulated over the centuries mm. and just all all of the kind of addictive habits so we're going through a process of purging purging and collective initiation yeah and it's creating a sort of social insanity Yes. And... Mm -hmm. Right, because it's been... Well, you know, among other reasons, it's like individual. So, like, if it's not recognized as shared, then mm -hmm. it's just going to be perpetuated. And it seems to be... It's becoming increasingly difficult for individuals to um, continue to go about their routines, going through the motions of you know, how our society and its institutions are supposed to function. And we don't really believe in that or less and less does it satisfy our sense of um, yeah. longing, certainly, but even our sense of like basic coherence and it just doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And all of these um, horrendous, uh, the dark side or the shadows of everything that has been, I guess, celebrated are coming into relief, are coming into view. Um, and so it almost seems to me that, I wonder what you think about this, that anthroposophy was Steiner's attempt to offer some spiritual path or even a, a religious form that would, um, that would help shepherd the, the human being individually and, and socially through this evolutionary bottleneck and this this initiation because he knew that people were going to be increasingly struggling and yes. he offered this as a <clears throat> a through line as it were yeah yeah i was gonna say it's like a midwife to of like modernity to what comes next yeah and um but i think that he uh I thought, found that interesting because he characterizes it that way, you know, that anthroposophy isn't like the end-all be-all, it's like something that is needed now. Yeah. And that, so he talks about it in this temp 
like um, like a, a way in which it has a lifetime, but like a long one, you know. But uh, but also like a kind of humility about what will come what will come in the future. Right. So I mean, he usually describes it as the anthroposophy is an attempt to lead the spiritual and the human yeah. to the spiritual and the universe. Yeah. Kind of reconnect this severed um, organism that has made humans feel as if we're the only conscious entities in the whole and the only, the only intelligent yeah. entities in the entire world and that everything else is just this sort of <laughs> mute, vacuous collection of junk that you know we can do our best to like engineer and yeah survive amidst but ultimately like we're just a flash in the pan and then when we die what i mean nothing and so that's the context of like our yeah modern civilization and no yeah. wonder it's it's cracking and, and oh, fragmenting and it's so pathological i mean i guess it was just part of the developmental process but if you think about it but i guess you have to you can't call it pathological unless it's out of its time so this is yeah it's it's i guess it's one of the more difficult parts of uh steiner's understanding of history is that in some ways the negative aspects of history the struggle the um the adversarial nature of history that that yeah it's 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 not um just a providential yeah progression it's it's a struggle and it could not work out yeah but nonetheless you know there are as there are adversaries there are also advocates there are friends yeah Um, there's like deep deep probably deep deep habits of the cosmos towards providence yeah but but we still have you know the capacity to totally change things as i think we have (laughs) Right. There's no question that, yeah, you know, we're in the Anthropocene, as it's said, and the human has totally transformed the Earth, and there's no turning back. Yes. So, even if we lament what has been lost and what will be lost in terms of biodiversity and um, the rest of the community of life, at this point, we're on a trajectory whereby, one way or another, human beings are the dominant power on the planet and we need to take responsibility for that yeah <clears throat> yeah and so I, I mean I was thinking about evil right and the way Steiner understands it is adversarial energy <laughs> in the cosmos yeah yeah and mo- modern and he also people have an ambiguous understanding of evil right yeah so, like does it really exist I mean, Nazism is a great example of how we would say, "Oh, yes, that's evil." It's when we, when we do that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, is there anything? Uh, yeah, I guess that really broke through to people in the 20th century. Like, nope, it's still here. But more and more now, this with this nationalist movement, a lot of white supremacists they'll either downplay it, downplay the Holocaust, or they'll that's say it never insane. happened, or they'll say if it did happen. That's the will to power. That's the nature of, of human oh, groups and yeah, their interaction. Yeah, that's terrible too. And that's all of history. And so that's we a need really to, that's a really unhealthy way to think about. They call oneself. themselves race realists, right? And really? so, you know, that's the direction that modern consciousness is that's scary is, is falling into around the question of evil. And I wonder how what you think about how Steiner's vision of evil is different. Well, um, I think it's very hard to understand unless. You, like, are living in it, I guess. Uh And so I don't... um, I mean, one of the things that he says is that uh, evil is... This is one of the things he says about evil, that it's... um, Evil is evil because it's something that is out of its proper time and place. Uh Uh-huh. You said that Whitehead said something like that, I think, right? Yeah, evil is creativity in the wrong season, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's interesting if you also consider, like, what is it, um, Tolkien's cosmogony with the Iluvatar and Melkor, or is that Malkor? Melkor, yeah. He's kind of like Lucifer who broke away to toot his own horn. Right. But then there's also Ahriman, or mm-hmm. Satan, mm-hmm. um, 
Yeah, so this, I think this is actually a really interesting that, like, I think what I was having a hard time understanding was Lucifer and what was evil about Lucifer, because I think Ariman is more familiar to people. Yeah. Um, this being of heaviness the and The devil, gravity and, you know? Yeah, like stuckness. Materialism, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Whereas, but, yeah, Steiner says how he talks about Faust and how... I guess he thought that Goethe mixed them with Mistopheles. Mm, mm-hmm. um, and but Lucifer is that that evil that is, I guess, hubris, and and it's not necessarily satanic. I guess mm-hmm. it's interesting. But yeah, to come, to become more familiar with that um, yeah. image of evil. Yeah, I mean, so Lucifer is... ego. They're about extremes. Swollen. Yeah, exactly. Lucifer is like the extreme of light, Uh and Mm -hmm. Armand is the extreme of gravity. Mm -hmm. And life happens in between in the tension. So this is, I mean, this is how I think of Steiner's relationship to evil, is that, first of all, it's not simple. Yeah. (laughs) It has these two poles to it. And second of all, it's... um, while evil is real, it's also essential for life and evolution and personality and freedom. Because mm-hmm. the freedom is the space of harnessing and healing, actually, the, yeah, the, it's the split choosing. between the two. Yeah. Because then they're, you know, like you mentioned Tolkien's vision in the Silmarillion of, of the creation of the world and the yeah. Lubatar, where the All Father creates these. Um, um, what are they? Basically, angels. I forget what he calls them. But oh, the Ainur. The Ainur. Thank you. So um, beautiful. Melkor is like the most talented one, and actually, Melkor claims to love Iluvatar more than any of the other. Uh-huh. Um, uh Any of the other um, Ainur. Ainur. But he loves. Uh, he loves Iluvatar so much that Melkor he, he goes off and he starts singing his own tune in honor of Iluvatar. But Iluvatar is like. Uh, it's like too egoistic. It's disconnected from the yeah, chorus. It's dissonant. It's disconnected from. Yeah, it's dissonant. That's the word. It doesn't relate yeah. to the chorus of, of. It creates this like. Of you other can even th- you th- it's musical, you know, yeah. and it is a kind of like, well, dissonant sound with the rest of the choir. Right. But it breaks. It basically time emerges from that. Right. And consciousness. Yeah, and of course, and. Tolkien's story, just like in Whitehead with the consequent nature of God, whatever Melkor does, it seems discordant, but then Iluvatar yeah, somehow harmonizes it. with it by yeah. Yeah, subsuming it but into not eradicating a more it. complex melody. Yeah, you, Iluvatar has to say yes to whatever Melkor does, but says yes in a way that out-contextualizes and some way, in some way harmonizes or makes beautiful what... It feels so true. It's <laughs> such a beautiful yeah. mythology. So... So, <clears throat> so this is a very different understanding of evil. Mm-hmm. Um, as it's because it's something you can't. I think in in the anthroposophical vision, evil is not something you can put out, project onto some other. Yeah, it's some. It's a power and energy that you necessarily have to. Oh well, yeah, be as engaged a microcosm, with. it yeah. is constitutive of our being. Yeah, so it's in you. Yeah, we all. No, I guess that's what's so significant about a lot of these, you know, the the, the stories of divine figures like Christ and the Buddha, the temptations and right. the human is a kind of microcosm of these pa- powers right. unfolding, the polarity that so, we see embodied in plant morphology. Right. Yeah. I mean, on the human plane and the ethical sphere, I, I really was so moved when I first read that story of Buddha's enlightenment, right before Buddha's enlightenment, sort of this last trial was um, oh, meeting Mara. So moving. Right? Yeah. And, and Mara's like, ah, I'm evil and I'm going to get you and you're horrible. And he and just he's like, touches the ground, right? Yeah. And basically is, is, is saying, uh, you, I, I am you. You are me. I, I'm not afraid of, of you. I see you, Mara. I, I see you. I see your suffering. Mm. It is my suffering. Mm. <laughs> Um, that's beautiful. And so I think that's like, it's not an, we think of this as like an ethical teaching, like you should behave this way, and yeah. the, but, but it's not an ethical <clears throat> teaching so much as maybe that's secondary, but it's, it's an experience. Yeah. 
yeah. it's a transpersonal experience, but nonetheless an experience. I can't call it mine though because it relativizes what I who I yeah. thought I was. It reminds me of Taoism in the way you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's like something that you basically attune to. Yeah, and Jesus says the same thing. Yeah, love thy enemies. Yeah, it is like what you were saying. You know, um, trying to make whole, basically, awakening in the separation and trying to. But we're so scared of this because of the inherited layers of trauma. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's so much vengefulness. Mistrust. Yeah. We we, we need to get revenge for how we have been wronged. Well, Um, I think, you know, like you were mentioning Nietzsche and the the idea of the will to power. And I think in the 20th century and into the 21st century, this idea that humans were like... You know, like social Darwinism, that we're, like, bad and selfish. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, really, truly, that's what we're, like, just, you know... Uh, I mean, I say, well, monstrous, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've really... I've recently... I think Barfield um, kind of conveys this. And also um, William Desmond, mm-hmm. when he talks about God and our participation in God as as being participation in something that is over determined yeah and that to me is like a shining sun you know hmm. it feels intuitively true of what God must be and what we what we must be what mm-hmm. we think of what we I think when we like think of ourselves highly in a justified way then that reflects an intuition of that participation in the overdetermined. Mm. And the sun shining. There is something extremely um, uh, misanthropic about the modern yeah. worldview, isn't well, there? It is. I mean, it is. Uh, Maybe it's what's the word? It's debasing of oneself. Yeah. I mean, I guess the Enlightenment vision began, I think, hundreds of years ago, a few hundred years ago, with really prizing the freedom and intelligence of human beings. But I guess after. Darwin, Marx, and Freud, we really got uh, that same intelligence and rationality unveiled this unconscious dimension, um, the animal bestial side of ourselves that we, the Enlightenment sort of repressed, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and we lost hope in ourselves, um, especially after the Holocaust. It's like if Darwin, Freud, and Marx weren't enough, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. We just yeah. were like, okay, the best... It was manifested. How do we pacify our violent instincts and just sort of consume ourselves into extinction? Uh, you know, because, like, we have no other higher purpose or, yeah. or ability. So it's like we gave up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, people have just lapsed into... Well, you know, the various industries, alcohol, well, advertising, of course, and the entertainment yeah. industry, all these things... They pacify people in a negative way, mm-hmm. and and uh, especially that I think the digital technologies have the potential to well ruin people's capacity for concentration and control over themselves. Right, and that is really bad. Yeah, I mean, I was trying to think of how to describe the initiatory process that we're going through right now, as Steiner understood it, and yeah. You know, I, I think obviously of technology, yeah, and its effect on our our consciousness and um, the role that screens play as like a veil, disconnecting us from mm-hmm. each other, from our from the living endogenous world. imaginative capacities. Yeah, because we're we're letting the screen image for yeah. us, imagine for us instead of doing it ourselves. Um, not that there needs to be a disconnect there, but we're pacified by the screen. But also the way that technology is sort of this um, collaboration, unholy collaboration between Lucifer and Armand, right? Mm-hmm. With the Luciferic principle of um, the sort of, you know, the creative... Elect- uh, These digital technologies. Yeah, the, yeah. this information superhighway and this hubris well, of like, wow, we could do anything with our technology. We can go to outer space. We could colonize yeah. Mars. And then... But, we can make our fantasies come yeah. true. But obviously there's also a an harmonic dimension of uh-huh. technology that materializes well, everything. Yeah. Yeah, like the, the execution. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> creates algorithms that run our lives and inhibit mm-hmm. freedom. 
yeah, I really, I really don't like how everything, all these different, you know, websites that we use now mm-hmm. and our apps or whatever it is are, you know, run on algorithms now. I just, it feels like, it feels like that was growing, but it just almost like clicked into place. Yeah. And now everything is like that. Remember, and it feels like being in some kind of flowing, dumb yeah. robot mind. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it reminds me of Ronnie Chang, that comedian that the Netflix algorithm thought we would enjoy. And we did, where he was talking about how Americans love Amazon and we just, we want it now. Like, we want to click it that and have it drop hilarious. into our hand yeah. immediately. And then he was just saying, like, I want it before I and want it. Like, I is, want you to know what I want before I want yeah, it. That is hubris, <laughs> right? That is. Well, like, that's what the algorithms exactly. are doing. Yeah. Like, you don't know you need this product yet, but we're going to sell it to you because you're going to realize you need it now. And yeah. so the algorithm's actually two steps ahead of our own consciousness. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, as Elon Musk jokingly put it. And they've profiled us. We're, there, we're the pet. We're the pets of this That's AI. That's what Elon Musk said? Yeah. Oh. Um, so how do we... But I mean, it's not... I like your shirt. Thank you. It's not uh, hopeless, though, right? Um, no, it's so not. What are, what are our avenues of escape from this nightmare? Well, okay, so um, Lisa Romero is another anthroposophist who I really appreciate. And uh, she, she's, like, looking at what's happening um, and interpreting it in a more, I would say, balanced perspective. So she's like, okay, so the conditions of this moment are requiring us all to engage with digital technologies and screens in a way that is much more than before. People, Mm -hmm. especially like older people, have to do it and they've never done it before. And But she says that, so, you know, with this uh, increase and the the increase in the, uh, um, I guess, devastating or deleterious effects of those technologies on our ability to concentrate and our other, I guess, soul capacities, you could say, Mm -hmm. Um, judgment, whatever, control, will, um, that this time could be seen as like a foil um, to, like a go to to start developing those powers um, more so. So she says like on Zoom, for example, um, like a like a group Zoom call that um, that the screen kind of what makes us passive participants, whereas in, in person we would be much more actively involved mm-hmm. in the meeting, and so we have to bring more of ourselves to the Zoom meeting mm-hmm. in order to actually participate at the same level. Yeah. And so this is what she you know she's it's an example of like the situation calling for the possibility of an in, increased growth in those capacities so right. it really depends on the individual yeah so, well whether or not they're doing things like that because everybody's in different situations so technology can act as a kind of evolutionary pressure yeah that's pushing the human spirit forward mm-hmm. like like yeah equal and opposite tension hmm. there is something Christ-like about trees, Uh you know, as the uh, mediating pathway between the sun, the light, and the the, the earth, the ground, Mm -hmm. gravity. Mm -hmm. So it's it's, within and without. mm -hmm. I think there is in that in that way a symbolic resonance between the role of Christ and the role of trees um, Mm. in 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 life and in, in the Bible, obviously with. I mean, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil are often thought of as two different trees. But I think um, if you know good and evil in this anthroposophical way we've, we've been discussing, then you see that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is actually the same tree as the tree of life. Yeah. Um, it's just the same tree seen uh, differently, I guess, from the perspective of love rather than... Um, separation Mm -hmm. and so there's no need you know the the tree of life is the knowledge that um, you don't need to have power over any other 
because power is itself relational. Power is capacity. Power is, yeah, the capacity to do, but also to, to be affected by, mm-hmm. right? To be in relationship. And I think that's the reason technology is so destructive is because it's rooted in power over. power over, as if we're separate from an environment that we need to control. Yeah. But we're not. <clears throat> yeah. That's what um, Steiner and I guess Lisa as well they distinguish between these different kinds of technology. And I guess that, yeah, the technology that we have largely today is power over. But there could be a, a renewal of techne, let's say, mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. art and craft. Yeah. And yeah, maybe there's some advanced electronic gadgetry as well that has more of a um, yeah, relational loving relationship to, um, or that engages in loving relationship with the environment instead of like to elicit and call forth rather than dominate and impose. Because mm-hmm. I, I don't think there's any reason that technology is intrinsically, you know, as Heidegger put it, enframing. Yeah. I think there's a certain totally I metaphysics agree. that it's construes like- it that way, but resonant technology or yeah. moral technology. Yeah, so ritual, for example, is Both. building stone yeah. circles or, you know, these build, building cathedrals. These are examples of resonant, technologies of resonance. Yeah, yeah, these sacred sites. They're working with the, basically, what we call matter. Mm-hmm. And the laws of the universe. Rhythm, ultimately. Yeah. Um, matter is rhythm. Tree. The spiral. Yeah. That's yeah. The spiral. Like that's what I I, I I want I would want to affirm a a Nietzschean vision of Christ as a dancing God. In that way oh, more more Dionysian, right? Like, like Krishna. This, sure, or Dion, Dionysius. Mm-hmm. The, this sort of the spiral of the tree is I think emblematic of that. Oh yeah. I agree. It's the, oh, um... You can't do it straight and rigid. Like, you can't unify gravity on light just with a pole. Like, mm-hmm. you, you need to be able to sway and swerve and yeah. spiral. Mm-hmm. Dance. Yep. Which is not normally how we think about But there's also this, like, things. aesthetic to the, to the dance. Yeah. It's like... Style. The spiral. Yeah, style. There's the dance is, uh... Um, of the spiral is a, what's called dilational symmetry mm. and can involve the Fibonacci sequence. Wow. Yeah. So say more about that. How does that proportion show itself in the spiral growth patterns of it's, trees? Um, it's such an, it's an, org- I mean, there are other patterns. I think there's like the Lucas sequence, which is a different one, I think that's what it's called. But the Fibonacci sequence basically grows out of itself. Right. That's why I think it seems, you know, we experience it as organic. We partake in it. Our mm-hmm. bodies are proportional according to it. It grows out of itself, meaning it's not a design so goes, imposed from without. It goes like zero plus one right. is one. Um, one plus one is two. One plus two is three. Aren't there two ones at the beginning? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's what it, I went through. Right, right. Zero plus one is one. Right. Oh, I didn't... Yeah, I didn't do the second one. Yeah. Um, I guess because I did zero. Right, well, the zero is the mysterious origin. Yeah. It's like, how do you get from zero to one? Yeah. I get how you get from one to, one to two. Well, that is... Yeah. Something happens there. Something happens. And, uh, <laughs> and then it goes to five, to eight, to yeah. thirteen. And... Um, so, yeah, the, the Fibonacci spiral reflects that kind of growth pattern. So it's not, oh, it was the Archimedean spiral. Mm. That, that's regular all the way around. It doesn't change. Right. It's width, I guess you would say, between the two. Um, but the Fibonacci does. It has that cumulative growth. And so you see like a lot of vines or something like that in the natural world that are curling around. Uh-huh. I think probably many of them. And... and um, other other things like that. So 
So the Fibonacci spiral is organic and the Archimedean spiral is more mechanistic. Yeah, their examples were human crafts. I, I think there may, maybe there are some that are found in the natural world, but there was like the rope and the chain and things like that. Mm. Interesting. So there's a, there is a geometry to Oh, to the dance. To the dance, and a geometry to the good. <clears throat> yes. Right, like the, the tree strives toward the light and sends roots into the ground mm. in, not, I don't want to say obedience to you, but in, harmonies, in harmony and in, in resonance with a geometrical pattern. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, what was I going to say? Oh, geometry is like the body of the, I guess, realm of forms. Mm-hmm. It bodies it forth so that we can... It gives coherency to things. That's right. why it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's why it, it partakes of the good, you know, and I think re- it's reflected that way. That makes yeah. sense. Like, it's kind of like the difference between uh, the aperion and the... What is it? Perion or...? Yeah. Yeah, the limited and the unlimited. Yeah. But right. The, I think the good is also... I like... Of course it's unlimited. The, the, yeah, unlimited. <laughs> Infinite. Um, but it's interesting to compare this sort of... After Christ. Basically platonic vision of um, the relationship between form, geometry, and the good. Yeah. As well as the beautiful. Like, you know, cosmos for the Greeks literally meant like a beautiful adornment. And it yeah. wasn't just like the... The physical order. Yeah, it's like um, it can be known. It can be known, and it can be loved. Yeah. Um, oh, well, yeah, we recognize. In fact, it, it can only be known ourselves. by being loved. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're uh, we are of it. Yeah. But modern cosmology so is. That's, I guess, love. It's like it separates the physical order and the geometry from yeah. any sense of moral. Uh-huh. Goodness. That's why people struggle with math. I or think. beauty, even. I mean, they'll admit, oh, yeah, this is beautiful, but only in a sort of a way that swallows our humanity and just dissolves or digests us, and there's nothing left. Like, it's just so massive and otherworldly that. Yeah, it's, this, it's kind of like the romantic, like, ah! You yeah. Know, sublime. It's the sublime, yeah. But, but, but not with. Uh, most modern physicists don't have a Kantian sense of. Um, well, I guess some of them do. That, like Kant would respond to this overwhelm of the sublime, looking at the starry heavens, by saying, "Ah, but my moral freedom yeah. gives me superiority over all, even all that space." <clears throat> I think I was thinking more of um, Edmund Burke, uh huh, and like that aesthetic. You know, he wasn't like a. I don't think he was was not Kant. <laughs> yeah, but he, he talked about the sublime as kind of like that. For him, beautiful was like something almost dainty. And uh-huh. I found, I was like, that's not, no, that doesn't work. But um, the sublime was like the opposite. It was like um, like relativizing and threatening. And sure. Uh, so I think when we're thinking about the way that, were you saying the way the cosmos is regarded today or the universe, whatever? Yeah, it's just, I mean, I guess some physicists will get all watery-eyed and like isn't this amazing but it's not really it's terrifying because (laughs) it's just these infinite expanses as pascal said and they terrify us because we have no ability to resonate with it Mm -hmm. it just seems so much more it has so much more magnitude than anything we've ever touched yeah or been touched by and so we don't know where we fit within it and it's not that the cosmos isn't isn't there but it's um I think we need a more, like, sort of um, meaningful There's, connection. Yeah, I think a different metaphysics probably, too, you know. Yeah. Because maybe there's a way in which all of that space or whatever... Um, is wisdom. Is Yeah, it's like it becomes coherent somehow. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how. Um, but especially, you know, it was really interesting hearing... Your conversation with the oh, I, the biologist? Yeah, John Torday. Yeah, and um, what he I appreciated what he was saying about 
Mars, the trip to Mars, and just the hubris, and it's just stupid, he said. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I agree, actually. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. It, yeah. Um, but just the conception of the Earth that y'all were kind of, you know, just like sitting and like, whoa, this is not, this would, you know, we don't understand this. Yeah. That. Right. He was talking about the role of gravity in shaping cell development and the wow. of the development of bones and that... The molecular bones, level, right? At the molecular level and the genetic Cellular. level and the, pro, the level of protein behaviors. Mm-hmm. Bones solidify and take form always in relationship to gravitational forces. And so mm-hmm. if you tried to grow a human being or any other earthly organism on Mars, the gravity is one third of what it is on Earth. So, and so it would you're be gonna, a different being, right? If it even survived yeah. the, the developmental process, uh-huh. it would certainly be a different being. Wow. Wow. It might be a horrific, tangled mess. Yeah. Well, and it just shows how, like, how this, that you would have to, if you wanted to do that, you would have to simulate Earth conditions, I guess. Yeah, which you can kind of do in space, but it's never going to be exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sure... Am but, I... but say more about... Um, what y'all were talking about in relation to that? Well, he's critical of this Darwinian understanding of evolution as as though the, f- the form and function of organisms evolves primarily through random genetic mutation selected by environmental pressure. Bring <laughs> him. That's too animal-centric as uh-huh. an understanding of evolution. And the vast majority of the history of life is single-celled creatures. Um, and so he thinks that the cell, the single cell, is the real unit of evolution and, and that cells evolve by communicating with other cells and multicellular organisms are sort of elaborations upon the form and function of single cells and, and the, the role of the membrane in a single cell and all the complex... Yeah, that makes total sense. ...sense organs, That's ultimately, that it has. microcosm, right? Yeah. Yeah. All the complex sense organs on the uh, membrane of a cell are uh, homologous to the sense organs and, and inner organs of, of us. Um, so the inner organs and obviously the organelles of the cell are homologous. And so we're just um, sort of fractal, yeah. uh, fractals of single cells, as we as animals. And um, he's imagining... But we're not just. In a diff- in a we're way. not just that. That's a way to look at it. That that tells us a lot. It is. A, we say it is an account of the physiological, and I think it leaves room for. He was gesturing towards a sort of energetic understanding of evolution as a flow of creative energy going back to the singularity that things seem to have poured out of the bit. The egg. Poured out of the Big Bang. The egg, the egg. that broke. Yeah, the symmetry that broke and that poured out its yolk. Um, <laughs> He wants to see that this whole evolutionary process is continuous with that energy event, infinite energy event. And I think if we understand energy in the way that Whitehead does or that Teilhard de Chardin does or that Steiner does, energy as sort of, um, what would Steiner say? It's, it's energy is the, it's the materialization of spirit, I guess, mm-hmm. right? Or somehow in the expression of spirit. I don't know. I don't actually know what he would say. I think it's it's a mathemat. I mean, ultimately, it's as physics understands it. It's a um, mathematical means of measuring what's called work, mm-hmm. uh, which is sort of the transformation of energy from one state to another. Mm-hmm. And life organisms seem to be able to um, surf this wave of negative entropy and and do work that maintains their own ability to do work and so there's this like self-referential yeah. circularity that arises and i think this is just a it seems like physical way of describing what mind is mind ingressing yes yeah. yeah yeah it's the physical side of what seen from the mental side is a process of ingression yes of ideas and forms into history yes so it's not in conflict with the more spiritual view of evolution. No, not at all. Um, it's, it's a more adequate... Descriptive. It's a more adequate description of the physical yeah. pull. Yes, exactly. Say. And that, you know, could reflect back on things because there's been this predominant understanding of physics and biology and all those scientific disciplines that is starting to die away. 
just a very material, it still saturates our imaginations though. So, but it's dying, I think. Maybe not, I don't know. Well, it's um, transforming. It's being called into question more and more. Yeah. And it's just hard to see what's on the other side of this threshold because, I mean, A, yeah. there's so many damn screens blocking our view. <laughs> and B, we haven't yet fully developed the new organs of perception required to see yeah. it and to feel it mm -hmm. or even to think it. Um, we don't have the concepts yet, but we can strive. I mean, it, we're really good at critiquing what's not working. Yeah. Um, and now I think the challenge for our generation, I guess, <clears throat> I think so, is to construct and create something to replace what has been so thoroughly critiqued. Yes, I agree. And new, new visions, new vision.